My name is Kira Sloan and I live in Ventura, California. I came to the practices of yoga my senior year of college. I was in pain and I was told that yoga could help. So I walked into the first yoga studio I found, Yoga Source. Christina McLeod was the owner. It was a little studio in Palo Alto, California. And it was immediate. I lay there in my first Shavasana just amazed. I'd never felt like that before. And it changed my life in that very moment. Well, I actually started teaching the very first day I took my first class. I went home that night and gathered my friends who I was living with and showed them the sequence that I had just been taught, or at least as much as I could remember. It just was so immediate a need to share the practices. There was just such a sense of everybody should feel this good. Um, so I pretty much started teaching right away without any training, just pure enthusiasm. I started to be asked to sub various classes, um, but it wasn't until 1999 when I took my first workshop with a woman by the name of Sarah Powers that I was compelled to actually take a teacher training. And what drew me to her was that she arrived late it was a class up at Kent Vaughn studio in Willow Glen. And the first thing she asked us to do was sit. And in the five years that I had been practicing yoga up until then, nobody had ever asked me to sit. And I was amazed and frustrated that, to find out that I couldn't. And so she was having a teacher training that winter up at the Mill Valley Yoga Studio, which is now a yoga works, I'm pretty sure. And the teacher training actually made me feel like I shouldn't teach because suddenly I'd been teaching um, in such an ignorant state of joy that suddenly there was all this information and all these things that I didn't know anything about. So it was actually not that great for my teaching for a few moments, um, but I got over that. It took me a while to feel though like teaching yoga could be a full-time thing. Um, when I graduated from college, I got a regular job and would teach yoga part-time and then quit all my classes because it was getting in the way of what I thought my career was. And then I would build up classes again, and then I would quit them all, and then I would build up classes again. And it wasn't until uh, the year 2001 that I finally realized that the only thing that really made me happy was teaching yoga. And I was working up in Silicon Valley, and the engineers were coming to my cubicle not to talk about code and feature sets and delivery dates, but to find out how they could feel better. And so in the year 2001 was when I finally left that, that job and started teaching yoga full-time. So corresponding with deciding to teach yoga full-time, um, my husband at the time and I found a little town in Southern California called Ojai. And it just, in this mystical, magical way, drew us towards it. And so right about the same time I decided to start teaching full-time, we moved to Ojai, California. And not much longer after that, suddenly we had a studio, Lulu Bundas. And then not much longer after that, we had a event called the Ojai Yoga Crib. And we had a teacher training school. And that was how I practiced and that was how I was in relationship with the teachings for about 15 years until 2016 when um, that chapter of my life came to an end. With the closing of the studio and the closing of the school and the ending of the event and the reduction of traveling and teaching, I no longer teach daily classes at this moment. And I'm often asked, what do I miss the most? And truly, 
what I'm aware of, what I'm missing out on the most is the intimate relationship that you get to be in when you're teaching yoga. Because it is in the teaching of yoga that you're in relationship with yoga. It's in the sharing of the teachings that you learn about the teachings. It's in the questions that you get to play and, and, and wrestle with and struggle with. So that's what I miss the most. Um, that and then of course the joy of getting to witness another's insight. You know, the opportunity to witness the moment when another has an aha that has nothing to do with you. You just happen to be there together. Um, and so now I, I get to practice more my relationship with the teachings in my daily life. I have to rely more on my intimate personal interactions throughout the day for an experience of the yoga teachings. I do have the great benefit of working with wonderful people here at Yoga Anytime. And always we get to find out if we're really working in the principles of the practice. And this reach, this, this endeavor of trying to translate the teachings of yoga through the medium of video and online, it's surprising how many people you feel like you can meet. And so I really rely on the members of Yoga Anytime to share their experiences, to share how it's going, to ask questions, to um, feel like there's something really happening. It isn't as, um, you know, fleshy as, as running a studio. Um, but it, by the context and the nature of it, forces a different kind of uh, tonality and, and a different kind of clarity um, that I appreciate. So as president of Yoga Anytime, my main job is to discover how to most effectively translate the teachings of yoga. Now, the primary way we do that is through filming yoga teachers teaching yoga. Initially, um, when I started, my sense of it was that unless yoga is happening here in the studio, like unless we're having an experience of yoga here, meaning that everybody here in the studio is on their edge of understanding and fully present and completely in love, then we won't be able to film yoga. <laughs> that it won't translate. That we risk filming stale goods. Like I was really resistant to anybody showing up and just doing a shoulder routine that they'd done a hundred times and they were gonna do it again. I also was under the um, understanding that the same kind of yoga that is effective on the ground, in person, in the studio, would also be effective online through the medium of the film. Which means that I was initially encouraging to some of our early teachers to share about themselves, talk about themselves, be more open about themselves, not just start moving and breathing, but to kind of warm up through an interactive kind of yoga foreplay, we'll say. And what I've come to discover is that the home yogi is gonna connect most effectively through the movement of his or her body and breath. That is how we're gonna feel connected. So one of the main things I've learned in making effective practices is that we need to help people start moving, breathing, and being in the practices of yoga, um, as opposed to listening to us talk about yoga. 
So that was my biggest first mistake, is because um, I love to talk about yoga, and so I just assumed everybody else wanted to hear us talk about yoga. Wrong. <laughs> so that's been um, that's been the biggest lesson in terms of how the content gets made, and to be willing to listen to what the members say, not only through comments, not only through emails, but just simply through the data of watching. You know, just really paying attention to what gets watched and being so fascinated with once a member uh, has found a practice that he or she likes, it gets watched over and over and over and over again. Like we, as human beings, we love we love novelty and we love new, and we also like to have our expectations met. And we're afraid of disappointment. So that's been amazing. It is true, both on the ground and in film, or you know, video, that yoga is a personality-driven business. But again, the personality that somebody might want in their home is different than the personality that they might want to go meet in a studio. And so I have also been surprised and interested that what seems to be more effective for more people more often is somebody that steps back a little bit, that doesn't burden the teachings with all that she or he is. Not that they're pretending to be somebody else, but can, in a way, humble themselves to the teaching and allow the teaching to come through and be effective, um, as opposed to their take on the teaching. So that's been really interesting. I am incredibly lucky with the yoga teachers that I have been allowed to meet and be close to. And it really starts with my very first teacher, Christina McLeod. Christina invited me in so tenderly and so lovingly and was so generous. I mean, after my initial class card, I never paid for another yoga studio. After my initial class card, I never paid for another yoga class at her studio. I was a total brat. It was Bikram yoga. And I would just wait for her to come adjust me in camel pose every time. Like I just had this expectation of, you're going to come adjust me, right? And she would. I still to this day have her voice in my head. I still to this day hear cues, hear instructions, hear ways of doing things that are all Christina. She was my first imprint. This was up in the Palo Alto, mid-peninsula area of California. And so a whole group of people up there, Cindy Walker, Kent Bond, and others just really were so kind and so generous in their um, enthusiasm for the new young dumb yogi. Russell Yamaguchi, my first Ashtanga teacher. What a wild one. After leaving the Bay Area, and I took many workshops up there with many named teachers who I love, too many to name. But after leaving the Bay Area and thinking about becoming a full-time yoga teacher, I was reticent because even though I had had all these wonderful yoga teachers, I couldn't think of a quote-unquote famous yoga teacher who I wanted to be like. You know, I hear I was going to be becoming a full-time yoga teacher, but I didn't know what it looked like to be a successful yoga teacher. I didn't want it to look like I was in a sex scandal. I didn't want to look like a diva. I didn't want it to look like I was a grumpy pants. You know, this is sort of, these were some of my models. And that was when I remembered about Eric Schiffman. And really, Eric Schiffman still... I took my first class with Eric in 2001. And still to this day, he's my primary yoga teacher. 
He was the first person to essentially give me permission to trust my own yoga. To trust that I was moving in a way that was correct for me. To allow myself to deviate from the initially suggested rules and ideas and practices that got me to where I was at that point, but were no longer serving my inner knowing. So there's no way I would have been able to continue the journey of yoga without Eric Schiffman. I've learned so much from Paul Gurley, his um, invitation of yin yoga. Sarah Powers was the first person to suggest that I just sit there. And even though I wasn't ready at the time, she really did nudge me on the path of Buddhism. Ravi Ravindra has so opened so many texts for me. He's thoughtful, investigative facility with the Eastern and Western tradition, as well as language, has unpacked the sutras, the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, texts that I never would have had the courage to really engage with without him. Uma Krishnamurti opened my heart up to the mystical path. Anuradha has helped me understand how I might one day pronounce Sanskrit correctly if I could. And now, and I'm of course leaving so many people out, but now I am really drawn to my primary Buddhist teacher, Jetsumna Tenzin Palmo. And while she's my teacher, I'm not her student. <laughs> she hasn't accepted me as such. But her dedication and her wisdom and her directness have opened my heart in ways that I never expected. 